Hi, good day, and welcome to Go on the Run. And today we'll be working on web sockets. So so far we've seen how to send and receive messages from our backend using Ajax or server sent events. Today, we're gonna to look at how to do the same using WebSockets. What are WebSockets? Well, if we jump over to the Mozilla Developers Network, reading their documentation for the APIs and so on that's provided um, for the web browser. And again, th these have usually have cross browser support, so uh, it's not a terrible idea to actually start there. So it says WebSockets are an advanced technology that makes it possible to open an interactive communication session between the user's browser and a server. With this API, you can send messages to a server and receive event-driven responses without having to pull the server. The pull there means that periodically you go, hey, do you have something? Do you have something? Which is sort of what it looks like um, server sent events we're doing, right? The browsers, they set a time between a few seconds or something where they would periodically um, reconnect and request information. Behind the scenes, we saw how there were multiple requests being sent. Here, we're gonna make, we're actually gonna make one connection and one connection only. And that connection is gonna remain open and we can send data in both direction. What we wanna do is part one, we will be developing the very basics of a to-do application. And our to-do application is going to allow us to create and delete to-dos. The reason why I decided to do a to-do application is because the other application we're doing sort of had a lot going for it, but it was still sort of big and I want to simplify the scope a little bit. And um, we're going to be able to mark a to-do as completed or done. We want to use WebSocket to be able to fetch to-dos from the back end or post them to the server. So that means that if we have a web client, uh, let's say our web browser, and we have our Go application is gonna be our API backend, this is now we're serving up the web pages that we're gonna fetch, right? Remember, um, we can do that from the Go application if we want, or from a separate, separate application. In this case, we'll do it from a separate application. So we have a separate web server to serve up the pages but then once we load those pages in our browser, our browser then will now make connection to our Go backend server on a very different port. And what we want to do is have this somehow set up a web socket. Once we have this web socket set up, you send a message, you forget about it, and the server sends you back um, responses or whenever. That it could be to the request that you send or just because it has more information. And in later um, videos, I want to do like a part two and three where we actually to use WebSocket to create a chat, chat application. And so that's gonna be a good demonstration of how we can push messages to the server and then the server can send it from one client and the server can then broadcast it to a number of other clients, right? Cause that would, what you would need for a chat application to work properly is somebody using a web client be able to send a message and then other people who are in the same chat room um, just sitting there and they receive that message that the one client sent, right? So that would be a perfect example of where you can get messages from the server without you first having to send anything. So we'll, we'll, by the end of this, probably in part three or four, we'll get to implementing a chat server, but we'll start off with a to-do app web application. I went through what a WebSocket is, but I did not get into how to use the interface. So if you click on the documentation here for the WebSocket, you can see that there are two ways you can call this. You can call it with a URL and optionally a second parameter that is the protocol, or you can call it with a URL and optionally an array of protocols. Since the second parameter is optional, when we create our WebSocket, we'll just create it using the URL and ignoring that second parameter. And of course you can read up on the specifics of the URL and the protocol, but the URL should be pretty straightforward. The next thing is what we get once we have a WebSocket object, and that is we get the close and send method. And as you can see, a WebSocket is very, very easy. Assuming that URL 
it's easy to specify, which we should assume because that's where our WebSocket um, server is running, which is what we're going to implement in Go. Then it's just specifying where that is. We just have to make sure our backend properly implements the WebSocket standard, just as when we did server sent event, we had to make sure to we modify our server to handle that. But once on the client side, we have a WebSocket, it's very easy to use. We literally have two methods that allow us to send data or close that connection. And so if we use the method to, of course, send data, how do we get messages back from the server? And of course, you can close the connection. Well, we use the attributes. And here there are a few attributes, and most of them we can ignore. I'll scroll down to the ones that are, I think, the most important. And it's these, these event-related attributes. There's the onClose, and this makes sense that if the connection is closed, that you might want to have some sort of function that calls and do some cleanup. You have error, of course, if there's an error connecting to the server or with the messages. And here is our on message. This is the most important, in my opinion, because this is how you will handle messages that you get from the server. As a server send message, remember, it's asynchronous, meaning that you're not going to send a message and expect to wait for a response. You can sit there once you register a handler for on message. Messages can come from the server whenever, as we'll see in our chat application, we'll be able to get messages even if we never send a message, if other users in our chat send messages, okay? On open, this is gonna be called, of course, once the connection is established. And of course, you can read things like the protocol already and the URL that you use to create it. But like I said, to me, the most important um, attributes are these four here, the on close, on error, on message, and on open. And of those four, the most important is on message. <laughs> All right. So there are other constants and so on. But if you scroll even further down, you'll see some details about how you use the close method and the send method. And you can use, you know, different types of string, arrays, and so on. And I'll scroll right past that to the example. And this is an example of how you use WebSocket from the client side. As you can see, it's very, very straightforward point to the URL. Again, we're going to be implementing our Golang server to say where we want to run. And you can add event listeners. Okay. So let's jump into the implementation. So what I've done is I've created a directory called WebSocket part one. Well, the reason I have two terminals open is because I'll have a client and a server. Now in this application, like I said, I want to do something different than what we were working with. So I'll develop our web client in Arela. Arela is a framework for developing web applications, single page web application. Now, if you haven't worked with single page web applications before, I encourage you, if you're serious about web application, you should definitely look at them. There are a number of them out there. There's Vue.js, React.js, there's Angular, and I've just discovered Arela. Now, I am a very big fan of Angular JS when it was Angular JS and now it's Angular. And I still sort of like it, but now that I see Arella, I like Arella even more. And one of the reasons I like Arella so much is because one, it has pretty much everything I like with the first Angular JS. And secondly, it does something that I do not like about Angular 2 and after. So uh, there was Angular JS, which was considered Angular 1, and then there's Angular 2, and then they just decided to call it Angular because there were two, there was two, three, four, five, and instead of keep track of all that, it's now become Angular JS is like the classic, and Angular is the modern one. Angular um, did something called components, which is what we also have in React and you have in Arela, but the way in which it did it in Angular in my opinion, since it came out, I thought it was more complicated than AngularJS. I understand the reason for moving towards components, but I thought it was more complicated. Fortunately, uh, the guy who did Arela, he used to work on the Angular project, used to work at Google, and he did Arela. And I really, really like Arela. So I mentioned all this so that you can see I will develop the client side of the application in Arela. You don't have to watch that part. I'm still learning Arela myself. 
I'll do a set of video on Arello and what I'm learning. But for this video, if you really want to see how I develop it, go to the end after I do all the WebSocket stuff. And then I'll show you exactly how I develop the client side. Since this video is about WebSocket, I will just simply show the application running that we're going to use to WebSocketified, okay? <laughs> to add WebSocket to. So let's do that. Let's run the application. Okay, and that's it. Skipping now to add in WebSocket to this application. Up to this point, I developed the web application. So I have developed it using Aurora, as I said, and this is how it works. So let's say I have a to-do. I'm gonna create some to-do. And we can mark to-dos as completed, and you can see there's a line through it. Let me see. And let's say I do a check mark. You can see a line goes through it, and I can remove to-dos. And so now we want to see how to add WebSocket to this application that we have that is doing a to-do list. And so this application, at least so far, does everything we need to do, which is add to-dos, remove to-dos, allow you to mark them as done. It simply doesn't use WebSocket. So let's just add the WebSocket part. So for now, I will close all these other tabs that I had to do with creating the web application. And let's just jump over and look at the server application, which is empty. And so for this, I want a main.go file. This is going to be the application that will listen to WebSocket connections and of course store our you know, to-dos and send them um, back a list. So how do we implement that? Well, the WebSocket documentation from the API from Mozilla, that's just about the client side. Let's start with the client trying to create a WebSocket. And so I'll just copy this code. Let's put that in some of this in the front end. So let's go to our application. And so what do I want? Well, if you think about it, once our application starts up in this constructor, I want to make a connection to the WebSocket. So let's say we want to create a WebSocket. So I'll store this as this, that socket. And so localhost and Right now, I know that my front end is running on port 8080. So my back end has to run another port. So I'll put it on port 8081. And then if the connection was open, we have a listener. It says hello server. It sends hello server to the server. All right. So on the server, if this was working fine, then we should be able to, let me do this all right so i need to um, fix these because this that socket all right so let's save that so right now our constructor will come up make a connection to our web socket send a message to set an event listener that for open once the connection is made and of course register a listener for messages from the server at that point, our construction is completed and our WebSocket is going to take over long. It needs to talk to the back end. Once it's connected, send that message. If the server responds with a message, we should see it. So we have our console here going. So we should see um, when things are happening. As you can see, for example, our application refresh and we cannot connect to our WebSocket. Oh, I would like to make that WebSocket, uh, let it call it this. It doesn't really matter. We can leave it as whatever but we can imagine our backend has many APIs and they're supporting some as web or web sockets, some are RESTful, some, as, some are server sent events. So I'll call it that. All right, so let's go now and work on this application for the backend, the Go. So for that, if you wanted to see how to do GoLang WebSocket and GoLang, and you do a search for GoLang WebSocket, you'll see 
basically this this result the top result is using the gorilla project web framework and this gorilla is a web framework written in go so we'll talk a little bit about that another time but the websocket implementation from gorilla comes up as number one and also you get this websocket implementation from the golang.org for um, and this x um, sub package is basically where they test out things new things that are, they want to put in go and they use this as a sort of a playground and then before it end up in a go language so go context which we haven't played with yet um, but if you know go context it used to be x context and then it showed up in standard um, and just go lang forward slash context but never mind all of that if you read this it tells you like you know what a much more full featured one is the gorilla web socket so if they're saying that here why not use the gorilla web socket so to use that we just simply copy this make sure that we get it so go get paste that so have that installed and then of course we want to import it at some point to use it well how do we use it well it tells you here that and you can read all of this i read it already so um, i'm not going to spend time here reading it with you but essentially you create an updater so this is the websocket updater and it's a struct so updater you populate with some values you create an upgrader object and then you within your handler when someone connects to that endpoint you want to be a websocket you upgrade the connection so if you know anything about websocket it's first a regular http request that gets upgraded and you could look at the headers going back and forth but for now we're just going to stick with using this um, package to implement do all the hard work for us and so let me just copy this so why not so i'll copy that and paste that here this is just creating a variable so i like my variables sort of at the top so i'll put this on top for now and if you scroll down to index and you look at the documentation for upgrader you'll see it tells you at all this upgrader struct has several fields handshake duration this read and write buffer size and if you read it, it says, oh, if it's zero, it sort of doesn't even matter with the, it does have nothing to do with the length of the messages. So since it doesn't dictate the length of the messages, I'll just not use it or set it. So I'll make my declaration much more simple. And this is just a variable of that type. So I'll just leave that as that. And there's the protocol, sub protocol, which we saw from the client side and we don't care about that anyway. We're not going to set anything else. This is an error function. This check origin. Now we'll come back and we'll see how we need to work with this. We'll need to set this. And so for now, let's just start to keep it simple. So we have an upgrader variable and we have an handler. Now this is just a regular handler we've done many times before now since we're doing it with H net HTTP package. Uh, we could call this, you know, WebSocket handler or whatever, but for now I'll just leave it at handler. But notice what happened. You just use the upgrader object and you say upgrade my connection using the response writer and the request and this nil value. That's fine. And you check and see what is what is returned. You get a connection back, and with this connection rep represents your WebSocket connection at this point, and an error. If you couldn't upgrade this connection to a WebSocket, then of course there's an error and you can print that out and if you were successfully able to upgrade this connection then you should be able to use that to send messages and so on so uh, how do you use it well if you if we go back to the top well, let me do back here and we go back to the top of this it says this is how you use it. You could sit in a loop, get a message from the client, and then send a response. So for now, for now, we will copy this. And of course we have to change it because we don't wanna sit there and do a ping pong type thing where we wait for a message from the client, then send a response, all right? It will work at first when we do, okay, I, set, I post a new to-do, 
and then I respond with the new list of to do's. So that's going to work for now. But once we start getting into like our chat application, it's not going to work. So that's why we're okay with copying this and using this. So we sit in a for loop and do this, um, you know, read a message, send it to this um, thing. And if we do the imports, so if you remember, there was this import we have to do for the Gorilla WebSocket. So let's make sure we take care of that. And as you know, if you don't know by now, I like using log log ros. And there we go. So there we go. All right. So we don't have any error messages right now. Now, one of the things I want to use, so if you read the documentation here, so go back to index and you'll see, uh, uh, let's see. So click on index. And once you have a connection, which is what was returned for us when we upgraded our connection, if you remember, once we upgraded our request, we had a connection returned. So we have an error and a connection. So once you look at a con the metas associated with a connection, you can see all the different things you can do with a connection. You can read message or read JSON. And this is the one I want. I want read JSON and I want to send JSON or write JSON. Okay. And so I'll change this to reading JSON. And to read JSON, we simply simply returns an error. And we can write just one object. So let's call this um, the response, we're going to send the client. And what we're going to read from the client is a request. Okay, so client request, let's make that um, client request, client request, C request, and C response. So what are these things, the client request and the client response? Well, let's just make them structures, right? And so for that, I'll declare some new types, I'll say type, and let's say client request, what, what do we expect from a client? So client request is a struct. And for now, I'll just say the type of message I want from the client. So the client is gonna say, here's a request and I'm gonna specify a type. The reason why I want type is because the client can say, this is a delete request to delete a to-do, or it's an add to add a new to-do, or in the case when it's first connect, it's just, hello, I'm here, give me the latest, the list of to-dos that you have. I don't have a new one to give you, but just give me whatever you have, okay? So that's gonna be the type of message, and this is going to be a string, okay? In the case when we're ready to do other types of, so each message is gonna have, each message will have a type, and also, like I said, in the case of, so what is the type? Type is, um, type is just hello or add or remove in this case, okay? And remove or remove, right? That's our type. It's one of those three that we're supporting. If it's hello, well, then we don't expect anything else because the client just started up. It's just saying, hello, I've, I'm connecting to you. Give me the list of to-dos that you have stored already. If it's add, then we expect that it should be a list of to do's. So it should be the to do's that um, we have, which what are the to do's? Well, uh, to do's are a slice is a slice of to do objects. And a to do object is just another struct. And each to do, like we said, is a description. description if I can know to spell string and it's done which is a boolean well I also like the idea that when I create objects um, to save like you know to do's and stuff they should have an ID so this should be an int in my opinion we should also have an int and we could go back and fix that in our front end to say that our to do also have an ID and that's gonna make th things easy for us so uh, let's save this 
So one of the things you can do with um, structs in Golang is you can embed other types. And this essentially gives it the same name. So we can use to do to do's as the name of this field to access this type, right? So that that's okay. All right. Um, and then if we're doing a remove, well, it's the ID of the object that we want to remove. So it's an int. Okay. All right. Um, so now that we have that, we should probably see that how this is encoded when we use in them for JSON encoding. And so this says omit ID if empty. Uh, of course, if we're going to send it to do object, it will have an ID. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, done again, okay, similarly, our done field is going to have a value. So um, I don't have to worry about if it's being empty, but I don't know what it might consider false to be empty. So let's just send that. Okay. Um, and then this is our client request. So let's say that's those are fields for it. And again, we have to do's, we have type and we have ID. All right. So this is our request, but we need one other structure for our response, which is our client response object. And that's a struct. And once we send into the, the client, what are we sending? Well, it's usually just a list of to do's. So um, the client response is just to do's. Okay, so let's put some fugal tags on there. And that's it. All right, so we need here in this for loop, uh, each time I loop around, I'll create a client request object. So I'll use a pointer because um, I create a new object and I get a pointer for it. So client request. And basically that is empty and I pass it to rejson and this will sit there and wait on the connection for the web client to send a message. I remember what our message looked like. It's a type and then these other things. Okay. All right. So we'll get that once we have it, if we don't have any problem reading it, then what we should do is maybe just log it. So we do log info F and we'll say message from client and we'll do client request, right? So that's the message we got from the client. And what else do we want it to do? Uh, bah, bah, bah. Uh, I think that's okay. Once we read this, oh, um, log that error. So I like error. Okay, good. All right. And so once we have a message from the client, we have to make a decision. We have to say, we are, again, we have these three types of message we can possibly get. We can get hello, add, or remove. So I'll use a switch statement to deal with it. So I want to switch on client request that type. and case if it's hello then now if i fail to send the message uh do i okay i have to create a response and send it so um uh, that is going to be well it seems like we need to have some to do's so to do's is of type to do's. Okay. So it's just a slice of to do's. And when, and when the client make a request for the messages, well, um, seems like what I should do is, um, well, I don't need a new object each time. So maybe I should have one up here. Um, actually, no, it, within my handler itself, I'll have a response object. Okay. So client response, Uh, there we go. These are too close. So client response and the to do's is going to be whatever to do's that um, are there. Well, 
I actually need to probably create a new one because this is going to be changing. So yeah, so I need to actually create a new one each time uh, after I get a request from the client, I need to populate a new response and send that to the client. Okay. So I don't, I'm not sure if I want to end every time return from this connection. If there's a failure, maybe if there's a failure in sending one time, I still want to try and read again. So for now, I'll take this out and then later on I'll determine, see if I really need it. Okay. So that's that. Um, the next case I need to deal with um, is essentially um, if I have a add or delete. So even though we're not dealing with those yet. So if I have an add, I want to add it to my list of to do's and then send, of course, the updated list. So that to me, since we have a slice, well, I'll just use append. So to do's is equals to append and append to my to do's. And we, of course, want to client request that to do's. Ah, why would the client request have to do's? Well, I made a mistake there. Um, so client request, oh, client request doesn't have to do's. The client, when they do an ad, they simply send one to do. That's it. A to do. That's it. So that's it. Um, I just get the to do that is sent in a request for add, for example, is one to do. And, and for remove is the ID of that object. So uh, it's not to do's, but really just add the to do from the client request. Okay. I don't like these variables. Client request and client uh, response are two um, thing. Let me make it more explicit. Client request. That's that's better. And then um, so a little bit easier to read. Um, I know it's a little bit longer, but it seems like it was just too cryptic. Okay. And so these are our to dos. Uh, to dos. There we go. And so I'll add the to do that I get from the client request. Okay. Once I add that to the list, then I just respond with the response, which is this have to be initialized. I should create a new one, but then update it by saying client response that to do's is equals to my to do's that has been updated. So we don't need that. So yes. So now I send that. So notice that my two last statements here are the same. So once I get here, what I should do is fall through to hello. So there we go. So I want to fall through and I want to make it clear that I am falling through from, I do add first, add these elements, then I fall through to do the same thing as hello. Now, what about when we have to do a delete? Well, uh, let's grab this and let's say we do delete. So in the case of a delete, we know that how we have the ID of the thing that we want to delete. And of course we want to send an update after. So, so as a matter of fact, after our switch case, man, no matter of which path we take, we always want to send an update. So I should just take that out and take out this fall through. And this is what we do. So in the case of hello, we don't really do anything. Actually, we can make that our default case. So case default. Actually, we don't even need a default. So we only really need to handle add and delete. Okay. Uh, maybe default we return nothing, but okay. Let's just return. I always return the list of things. So delete. 
let's handle delete. So delete, we have the ID. So in the case of a delete, we have the ID of the thing we want to remove. Well, actually, this is not complete because when we add an object, when we get it from the client, we don't expect the client to keep track of the IDs. So we should be keeping track of IDs. So I want a variable here to keep track of IDs. So to do IDs, okay? And that's a int. And we know it's going to start off as zero. So the first, when each time we add a, we're asked to add a to do, what we should do is increment the ID. plus plus and then we should assign that to the client request that to do that ID so now we have given our so each time we add a to do we increment and in. even if we remove some this number never goes down it's always increasing okay so that takes care of that so now when we are asked to remove an item well, we just search for it, one with this ID, and remove it. So to remove something, um, let's do this. Um, I'll create a function to do the remove. Okay, so that's take care of that. And then after we finish this, we should be able to update um, our to-dos to be equals to the new temp. So what we've done is copy over all the to-dos except the one we don't, we want to remove to temp, and then we assign back temp to to-dos. So that's take care of removing it. And of course, at the end of this function, then we send that updated um, list. Well, um, it seems my updated list, I need this to be here. Uh, 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 yep, there we go. So I need that to be at the end of my updated list. So once I add something or I remove something, then I send the updated list. All right, so let's see how that works now. So this is our code. And oh, we haven't finished yet. Oh, we have our main. So we just create the handlers to deal with all these messages from our WebSocket, but we actually haven't registered a handler. So let's do that. So just in case we can set up a web server there. And now I think, okay, so what is this? Oh, okay, it's telling us that how oh, this should be TODO ID. So Google has, Golang has some suggestion on what we should call this. All right, so let's see now. Let's run our application. So we need to go to our server directory and do go run main. And this look like it's running. And let's keep that there. And if we go back here to our application and we refresh, it should try to make a connection and it says, can it establish a connection to the WebSocket server? So why is that? Uh, okay, let's go to our code and let's see. Okay, we're going to the JavaScript and it says, okay, on connection, open, send a message. What we should probably do is register our event list. Now remember there are several ways to um, connection error. And remember there's an on error and there are two ways to do it. You can do add event or you can just set that property itself. So there's error, if there's an error and we don't wanna send it, we wanna do console log. And we want to log this event, whatever is passed in. So this is the error message. So if we go there and we look at this and what do we see on error, what is the problem? Well, error type, it says the error type 
but let's see websocket localhost 8080 websocket so there's a connection can it establish or is it can't establish a connection so oh a websocket or something oh there it is websocket request origin not allowed by upgrader so if you remember what is request origin this is cross type scripting so let's review what cross type scripting is so we talked about this before when we talk about web applications. So let's say we have a web browser or some web client and we want to fetch some pages from a web server. It doesn't matter how those web pages are being served up. It could be from live server, Python, Nginx, Apache, it doesn't matter. And so that's being served up from one port. Let's call it port 8080, just as our application is currently being served up. And now we want to do Ajax or a service end event or a WebSocket to a, another application running on a different port. As you can see, the port where we fetch our pages from, and now the port where those same pages, once they're in the web browser and the JavaScript, where they want, so this should now just be pages. This should be where you fetch the HTML pages and JavaScript, but where that is trying to originate a connection, it's back to a different port. Actually, the web pages doesn't matter, it's the JavaScript. So where you fetch your JavaScript, and now that JavaScript now is trying to make a connection to a different port. And this is called cross site because you're going from one site to another site, even though it might be local host, it's still cross site. So your application must say, oh, I allow this. So let's go back to our Go code. And like I said, when we look at the documentation for WebSocket, it told us that oh, we might have to take care of this. And we know this from when we look at the upgrader object, um, the upgrade object. When we look at the upgrader object, it had this field called check origin. And if you look at the documentation for this, it basically tells you that if this function returns true, then you're saying, oh, I allow connection from here. And of course, notice it gives you the request. So you can interrogate this to see who is making that request. You can read the documentation to tell you by default, it returns false. So we want this to return true. So we should go to our Go code and inside main, we should then set this after we, before we register and allow connections, what we should do is we should say on our upgrader, upgrade object. So it's called upgrader object. We should set this check origin property to equals to some function that takes this and return Boolean. And this is our function and we should return true. And that means that when this is called, just returns true for whichever, wherever we have a connection from. And so close this and run it again. And let's go back here and let's refresh. And notice now that the socket is undefined. Uh, this that socket well where is this coming from now seems like everywhere we're getting an error so this is app 18 so let's go check app 18 so this that socket now within this function this referring to this function when it's called and of course that function the context of that function there's no this that socket so what i would prefer to do is in this constructor um Instead of this, I will instead say, uh, well, actually, if I register it using the event handler, then that should be fine. But anyway, um, let's do this. Let's say this, that, so var socket is equals to this guy. And then um, I can say socket is equals to socket, right? Or, you know, uh, I can, for simplicity, I can use connection. Um, but basically what I've done is created a variable inside this constructor function. And now I can use this variable here and this function will close over that variable. Okay, closure. And so just like we have in Go. And so now I shouldn't have any problem. And you could see that it's, it didn't give me an error because the code was updated. And so if I go back here, you can see that what we have a connection. It says it's going away. It's closed or whatever, but it invalid character H looking for the beginning of 
value blah, blah. well what we know this is we're trying to read a json right we said read json in go we say read json and that's what we're trying to expect here we said read json so what we were trying to send from javascript is not json we're sending this hello server that's fine that should be hello server but no we have a type we said that our message should be a json object with a type field and the value of the type when you're connected first connected should be hello well it actually anything is going to work because we didn't check specifically for this and so this is a json object so this should be fine so you see message from client is hello and the id is zero um uh, well our first object here is empty so and then which an id no description and false and then of course the id is zero because well we don't actually we didn't actually send anything so this now should send back to the client once it did that it should now send back a empty list so let's go to our client and see if we got anything and here we got message from server is empty right because we don't have any an array to send back so it's empty so on the server side i think we have everything we need we have everything to add and update and so on so let's just work on the client so here if you think about it when we let's do a receive once we get a message from the server what should we do with it well it seems like when we, once we get a message from the server we should add it to this to do but let's just see what that message look like first so to do that let's just send the message because you know once we send the message the server is going to respond back with a list of the messages of the to do's on that server so we know how to send the message already so let's copy this and here's the problem though we have in the constructor this variable called this that socket so they should allow us in our add to call that just like what we're using this that to do's well we should be able to do the same thing here and we're not going to push it onto a variable instead we're going to send our to do to our server how do we send it to to do well we call the json that stringify turn an object into a json string and the object we want to turn into a json string is our to do so okay so this creates it and sends it to our server and so let's test that so a b c d and of course we don't have anything to show but we have message coming back from the server unfortunately all our messages from the server so far they are empty well let's do some debugging on our server to see what high what's happening so if we're sending a client response to our server then we should print out what the client response is and so let's do that all to do's and that should allow us to print out all the to do's we have and also compare it with the message we're going to send to the server so let's run this again we're close there's just a little bug somewhere all right so a enter b c d whatever and then let's go look at our back end and nothing okay well actually i need to refresh to make a connection and do a b okay and that's good enough and so here we can see that sending message to the server nothing it's, it's not appending so what we need to confirm is that we have da, 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 the message we're getting from the client let's see message from client hello okay um message from client um okay when we do add ah that's why is because we're not specifying the type of message ah silly me so our message from the client is supposed to be type and then what we want to do so it's not quite exactly like this right and the type is 
add and then the to do is the value that we send in which is this object stringified well actually it's to do and we actually stringify the entire message so we stringify the message itself or rather the message so so that's what we need to do ah we need to say what type of message we're sending and of course this is going to be the same thing when we get to delete when we come to delete we we don't care about actually doing the delete ourselves we're not doing the delete ourselves and instead we need to say this is a delete message and the id that we're going to use for this delete message is to do with that id well and for that we need to go back to our to do a json and say that oh it has this that id equals to like zero for example and in javascript that's just id okay so now let's try it again so uh i didn't think we had to change anything from in javascript in go so we don't have to update that so let's this should have been connected again so a b c d and as you can see now our server is sending us those updated messages and the list is growing now we just have to store those so from the servers we have this object that has a field to do's which is a array of to do's so we just need to save that in um here when we receive a message from the server well that to do's equals to event data that to do's okay if this is indeed a java object then we should be able to access this field to do's and so we should assign it here so what is this complaint about all right uh oh we don't need this all right so that should work if it doesn't work we'll come back and fix it okay so a b c and it's obviously is not working so at least the back end is working e f okay we can see those messages are growing let's see if i suspect that what's happening is this that to do is getting called just like oh when we were trying to call socket from within this function the this that to do since um this that socket referred to something else i think is the same thing that's happening um app var app equals to this okay and then from now on if we want to refer to something like the socket we can just say app that socket and this is the same and so we don't actually need um, to use this variable because we can just say this at this point and this is just java weirdness and we can say app that socket which app was already is a variable that can be closed over because it was assigned this before this function was called so if this again more use of this sort of makes you crazy that is because java is just a weird language and so app that to do's is what i want to set by saying what if i had a set of let's say description test so this should demonstrate whether or not i'm setting my to do's from this callback so and it is and so we could see that so um to do one so if it's updates yep so this is fine what seemed to be the problem is that maybe data is the type of data is not what i expect so let's do console.log um, type of and let's do event that data to see what is the type of that data and so it's a string it's a string so if i do b c so this is it's all a string that's coming back so what i need to do is turn this into a json object so now there we go 
there we go notice how i did not have to request um post message before i get it once i connect it like so if i refresh it goes to the server gets some messages and i my remove is working there are no messages on the server and then if i do and enter enter those messages go to my server and i can see them in the back end i can see there they are and notice the id for them it keep increasing even though i can delete messages and add new ones i can use the id so that is how you tie your front end to your back end with websockets if you like what i'm doing you want to support it please contribute if you can afford to otherwise to that keep enjoying the videos subscribe spread the word take care bye see you in the next video